thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to the organizers. It's a very nice privilege to speak here. Um, I will keep the first lecture quite elementary. Um, in particular, the first hour will be mostly things about Gaussian ensembles and motivations. And we will get slightly more technical about universality in the last half an hour uh, today. So my plan for, for these lectures is um, today to um, talk about some um, some motivations and the so-called local law. Tomorrow we will introduce um, dyson brown motion and let's call it just dynamics because we will also look at a bit of eigenvectors. And the last lecture will um, be about how you may want to combine information about eigenvalues and eigenvectors in terms of universality to prove um, things about models which are not mean field. So th there, is, there has been a lot of nice progress, um, a lot uh, under the impulse of Erdos and Yao, about universality for mean field random matrices. In particular, um, Balint talked about the Gaussian ensembles, but you may wonder whether the local statistics um, <coughs> at the edge or in the bulk of the spectrum are the same if your matrix is not made of Gaussians, but of Bernoulli, for example. And uh, this is now very well understood. Um, I think what it will be more and more challenging in the future of the theory is really to go beyond mean field, uh, namely the, f the models of interest for physicists are when the amount of randomness is much smaller. And can you create random matrix statistics with much smaller amount of randomness? Um, so in particular, we will talk about it in the last lecture. Okay. Um, so today, um, let's talk a little bit about Gaussian ensembles first. So Balint introduced a Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, GOE, um, which uh, I will scale in the following manner. The entries um, H, I, J are distributed like um, standard Gaussian scaled by a factor square root n, because this is going to be um, n by n symmetric. And you have a slightly different normalization on the diagonal with a square root of 2 over n and 0, 1. And because of this slightly different normalization, uh, this ensemble of um, random matrices is invariant, as Balin told you, by all, any orthogonal conjugacy. So for any fixed O, which is in the orthogonal group of size n, O star H O has exactly the same distribution as H. OK? And this invariance allows you to calculate some Jacobians in some contexts. And uh, that's why, for example, we will see that the eigenvalue distribution is explicit. Now, you may wonder, um, are there many such examples of uh, random matrices which are invariant by orthogonal conjugacy? So here is a statement. Uh, if you take n by n symmetric matrices with um, the following requirement, all entries are independent up to the symmetry condition, of course. And you have invariance by orthogonal, any orthogonal conju um, conjugacy. And you want to avoid some, some degenerate situations like identity, say. Um, then only GOE up to the scaling uh, is going gonna, is gonna to satisfy these con conditions. Okay. So this is why this is such a, a natural ensemble. Um, so what do we know about GOE? So in particular, why did I scale it with this uh, square root n? So here is the scaling ID. So I, as I told you, I, I, will, I will just do some heuristics and simple things first here. Um, 
if you calculate, for example, the trace of the square of your matrix, this gives you in, in, some information about the typical amplitude of eigenvalues. And if we want the limiting spectral measure to be on a compact set of order one, um, then it happens that this is a good scaling. So um, in particular, you can calculate um, 1 over n times the sum of your lambda i square. Trace of h square, you expand, you expand your trace, you get the sum of h i j square. Each one of them is going to be of size 1 over n because of my scaling. You have n square of them, but I have an extra factor n here. So altogether, this is an order 1. So this is another one quantity. Okay, so this is a good scaling. Now, because of this orthogonal conjugacy um, invariance, what else do we know about this um, the GOE? We can actually um, compute the joint eigenvalue distribution. So my notation for the eigenvalues lambda i here in doing these lectures. It's always going to be an ordering in this way. And uh, the distribution. So the law of my vector lambda is exactly the following one. You have a repulsive part product of lambda i minus lambda j times exponential minus n over 4 sum of lambda i squared. And um, I will not pretend it's just an exercise, uh, but I will not prove it. And um, this um, can be seen in any good book on random matrix theory. Okay. So um, why is this important? Because from these types of expressions, you can actually calculate things like the, cor the correlation functions of these points, the global joint eigenvalue density. You can have some phenomenology as well. Uh, for example, here, one thing that is important and uh, recurrent in our uh, lectures is that you, it's very unlikely to get lambda i and lambda j close together. And uh, we want to understand from variety of points of view why this is true. Okay. Um, okay, so Balin told you that you have this uh, Wigner semicircle law. Namely, the rescaled um, eigenvalue um, empirical spectral measure converges to the projection of the uniform measure on the unit disk on the line. So 1 over 2 pi square root of this 4 minus x square. Okay, which is a, a well known thing. And typically, if you make an histogram of the eigenvalues of a very large, um, actually, just go by, just make a simulation of 20 by 20 or something, and you will, you will see that it converges to this type of, of shape. Um, so v Wigner's contribution goes way beyond that. Uh, he actually proved uh, that this, this convergence holds even if you don't have Gaussian entries. Any, um, standard uh, normalized uh, random variable with high enough moments uh, works here. And uh, he did it by the method of moments. So as uh, Balin told you, the moments characterize the limiting spectral measure. And uh, in particular, you can take the traces of high powers of h. You end up with a counting problem, like counting some paths, and you, you have some, some Gaussian moments involved, and so on. And uh, you will find out that it converges to the moments of, of this measure, which are the Catalan numbers. Okay. So um, again, not an exercise, uh, but not something we will prove either. If you want to understand from a different point of view why this is true, you may forget about the matrix and just look at this measure. And if you write it in a Hamiltonian form, exponential minus h, you will find out that the uh, minimizer of h is exactly in the large n limit, uh, the semicircle law, okay, by some kind of Riemann sum approximation. So this is one, one, one thing to know about this um, Gaussian ensemble. 
Uh, one object which will be of recurrent interest for us is the steel gesso transform. Um, in other words, uh, the trace of the resolvent. So we, I, I will quite often denote G of Z to be one over H minus Z, where Z is in the upper half com complex plane. And if you take um, the trace of this, one over N times the trace of G of Z, denoted as S for stages. Um, this gives you information about the spectrum, if you know jointly in many Z's uh, information about this, this object. So it's known for that for, for the semicircle distribution, um, the stages transform as, as the following expression. Um, so, um, so this one over N trace of G of Z converges as N goes to plus infinity to uh, just what you expect. If I give a name to this semicircle distribution, this is just this number here. Okay, and we will not really care about what, what this is, even though you can just calculate it by uh, some res residue theorem or argument, okay? So, Professor, that basically is a kind of definition? Uh, yes. That's my definition for stages transform. Thank you. Okay, so this is my, my Gaussian ensemble. This um, S of Z converges to this quantity, which we will call M of Z. And I don't care about what M of Z here, but I care about the fact that it satisfies one quadratic equation, which is the following one. M of Z plus its inverse plus Z equals zero. And it's not clear at all from what I wrote on the blackboard so far. Okay, so why? So we, we will just see that in a minute, okay? Um, now, We want to understand the fact that we have repulsion between eigenvalues, um, even though we don't, uh, imagine you don't know this explicit formula, do you have a um, heuristics, physics type of argument for repulsion between eigenvalues of this ensemble? Okay, and this is actually one of the, one of the origins after the statistical aspects of random matrix theory. Um, from a computer science perspective, von Neumann was interested in random matrices at some point. And uh, he um, just mentioned some qualitative aspect of, the, of this repulsion uh, in the following way. Um, so just take a two by two matrix. I told you it's gonna be elementary. Okay. Um, so the story about universality, all of these quantities we are looking at at some point will become universal. And this was this vision of uh, Eugene Wigner, uh, who uh, wanted to give a model for the energy, the stable energy level of heavy nuclei. And um, he observed that there, these energy levels have a small discrepancy. They look kind of regularly spaced, but not exactly. So for example, a Poisson point process would not be a good model for that. Um, so he just decided uh, to um, model it by the eigenvalues of a random matrix because these energy levels are actually um, eigenvalues of some operator in describing the quantum system. So, um, but he started with a two by two matrix, really. And um, what he found as a, as, a, as a distribution ends up to be very close to the truth um, of the large N random matrix, random matrix here. So um, if you just start with, with your matrix A, for example, imagine you, you have such a matrix here. Um, okay, my symmetric matrix, what, what the eigenvalues are, so here, 
So here we are. So this is one half of the trace minus plus or minus one half of square. Okay. So these are my, both of my eigenvalues. Let's call them lambda. Or this is bad notation. Sorry, lambda one, lambda two. And um, from there, wh what you can observe first is um, if you want to create an eigen, uh, a matrix with these two eigenvalues coinciding, what kind of choice do you have? If you, if you want lambda 1 to be equal to lambda 2, well, obviously you need to, to have the sum of these two squares, which is 0. So A needs to be C and B needs to be 0. OK, very simple observation. But what this tells you is that uh, in this three parameters family, it's on uh, the, those matrices with um, um, multiplicity in the spectrum have codimension two, not codimension one. Okay, so um, this gives some idea of a repulsion, uh, which appears also in the large n limit. Okay, it's very unlikely to. So it happens that this codimension two is true in any dimension. So let's try to understand why. So imagine you have Hn, the set of um, ma uh, symmetric matrices. Of size n. And um, let's call it Hn tilde. Those who have uh, some multiplicity in the spectrum. So in particular, lambda 1 equal lambda 2, for example. So let, let's try to understand as a manifold the dimension of uh, HN tilde. Uh, but I'm going to start even easier. Let's try to understand the dimension of HN. So uh, for HN, obviously, you, have, you can choose your entries. It's an n by n matrix. So it's n plus n minus 1 plus blah, blah, blah. So for HN, dimension is going to be this guy. Now, imagine I want to choose my matrix with multiple spectra. So this n, the first n here, can be understood as um, choosing your eigenvalues. So, but if I have a multiplicity, a multiplicity I just have n minus one choice. Okay. So n minus one, and this one is for the spectrum choice. Okay, then this n minus one here uh, could be understood as a dimension for the first eigenvector because it's on a sphere of dimension n minus one. Okay, so this is first eigenvector, but here still it's n minus one. This one is for the eigenvector. For my first eigenvalue, say lambda n. Then I need to choose an eigenvector in the orthogonal complement. I have n minus 2 as a dimension for the next second value, and so on. Okay. And where do we start? So we end up with lambda 3, for example. So what about the eigenvector for lambda 3? For lambda 3, um, I just have a dimension 2. But at that point, I have no choice at all for my eigenvector for lambda 2. And the reason is, no matter which choice I will make, I will end up with the same matrix. The because, because lambda 2 equals lambda 1, if you take a 2 by 2 orthogonal matrix, O star times your diagonal times O is going to be identity no matter what. Okay? So it's not 2 plus 1, it's 2 plus 0 plus 0. And uh, this 0 plus 0 is because, obviously, for any 
to back to orthogonal matrix, you have your O star lambda 1, lambda 2. Okay, because these, these two are, are chosen to be the same. Sorry? So, so, I mean, you don't require two eigenvalues to coincide. It was 2 plus 1 plus 0. Uh, yes, it was 2 plus so 1 plus 0. One this plus 1 is, uh, needs to be read as plus 1 plus 0. Right. Yes. So that's you true. lost 1 at this point and you lost 1 at the eigenvalues. That's true. That's true. Okay. Um, all right. So now, exercise. Do the same for the so called. Um, Hermitian ensemble, not the symmetric one. So you define now the GUE. Instead of my definition of invariance by orthogonal conjugacy, I take a definition uh, invariance by unitary conjugacy, and I enlarge my space of matrices to Hermitian. So it happens that the entries are Gaussian with some normalization which is chosen so that you have the good invariance property and so on. Okay, same thing. Um, but now what is the codimension? You will find that the codimension now is actually not two but three. So then the codimension of uh, let's call it uh, Hn but for Uh, for the complex, for, for the Hermitian ensemble in Hn, this is actually 3. Okay. Exercise. You, you will start the same way, but something more happens by the end. Okay. Um, now, this is the real code I made. Yes. Um, so all of this is quite qualitative. So what, what, did, what else did Wigner do? Um, so v Wigner's work went beyond that. Okay? Um, he, for example, as a first step beyond that, he said, well, now let's take A and C to be Gaussian. And uh, what is exactly the distribution of this object? Okay. So this is Gaussian plus Gaussian. You take Gaussian squares to the one half. So in particular, this tells you something about the tail, which is Gaussian. Okay, so the gap between lambda 1 and lambda 2, which is just this number, is going to be having a Gaussian tail. So um, if A and B, uh, A, B, and C are Gaussian, Lambda 1 or lambda 2 minus lambda 1 has Gaussian tail. Okay. And um, it happens also that you can see that the density of lambda 2 minus lambda 1 vanishes at 0 because you, you need um, this being 0, you just see that the density vanishes at zero. So in particular, the density of lambda two minus lambda one is going to look some, something like this. And this is called the Wigner summarize. Gaussian tail and uh, vanishing density at zero and actually it vanishes linearly here. Okay. If I, if I was doing the same thing for uh, the Hermitian ensemble, because I have more repulsion because of, of my co-dimension argument, instead of having a linear vanishing, I would have a quadratic one here. Okay. Um, now, how accurate was this? So ne let's go back to the large n-dimension and let me state the results about uh, what happens in the microscopic limit for large n-dimension. So remember, I have my semicircle distribution. If you consider your eigenvalues, which are lambda 1, 
lambda 2. So I, I had my ordering there. Up to lambda n. You know, thanks to the previous lecture, that lambda n is actually very close to 2. Okay. And um, that it should live actually on a scale uh, n to the minus 2 thirds. Uh, how can you understand this scale n to the minus 2 thirds? Um, because of the quadratic vanishing of the circle here. So let's, let's just talk a, a bit about the scale. So the scale for lambda n. Um, assume that you have um, your lambda i's which are always close to their typical location. So let me define the typical locations as the quantiles of the semicircle distribution. So um, So you define it as the integral of your semicircle distribution up to gamma k, which is equal, say, to, um, uh, so I, I'm not going to say exactly k over n, but k minus 1 half over n, the reason being that I want my lambda 1 and lambda n to have the same role. Okay. So um, if you define it this way, then what you really expect is that lambda n is going to be 2 plus or minus n to the minus 2 third. Just a calculation of, with this quadratic vanishing, the antiderivative and so on. Okay. So, the, the good heuristics is the following, that if lambda n minus gamma n, if this distance behaves typically like gamma n minus 1 minus gamma n, then we expect this random variable here, xn, which has typical size of order n to the minus 2 thirds. And it's really something like this. If you look at this density here, you, you, this lambda i is actually going to oscillate, being able to oscillate up to, up to its neighbor. But, but it's not an easy thing to justify this here. Okay. Um, okay. Now, um, let me go a bit to the description of my microscopic limits. So to describe my micro microscopic limit, I'm going to introduce a generalization of my um, measure on endpoints up there with a different inverse temperature. I, can, I, I will introduce an extra parameter. So let mu n beta to be my measure 1 over z n beta. So as you can see, I change the strength of the interaction between my lambda i's. And the reason I did it is because this parameter beta is natural from two perspectives. The first perspective is if I don't consider my Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, but my Gaussian unitary ensemble, then my, the eigenvalues distribution is going to be exactly this one, but with a new beta, beta equal to, as I, as I will just write. And also because this is a, um, you can think about it as uh, the equilibrium measure for, for particles in Coulomb interaction in dimension two, but restricted to a line. But the Coulomb interaction in dimension two is log and you restrict it to a line. 
So, is that, so there are reasons why this is natural. Um, now, so for beta equal two, this is a spectrum distribution of GOE. So what is known is um, that for any beta, both in the edge uh, scaling limit or in the bulk scaling limit, there are limiting uh, random variables. Uh, Balint will tell much more about it. I will not focus on the description of these random variables. I'm just stating you that they exist. So this is a theorem to which many people participated. That for this limit, so this is as n goes to infinity. Uh, first, you have the bulk uh, gap distribution. which um, you need to rescale by a factor n in the bulk. So that's lambda j plus 1 minus lambda j, the gap between two dis successive eigenvalues. And uh, you rescale it by the density of the semicircle distribution. Yes, at lambda i. So that this is a quantity of order 1, typically, uh, of expectation 1. And this converges to a limit which will not depend on j in the bulk which I'm going to call here uh, go down with parameter beta, but this is not historically really correct. Um, for beta equal 1, 2, and 4, these are things which um, have been found thanks to Granbritic works of Godin, Meta, and Dyson. And uh, the extension to general beta comes back to what Palint uh, tells in, in, in these lectures. Okay. Um, What is the range for i and j? So, um, so first, i is j, thank you. And uh, second, um, so you take j between some epsilon n and 1 minus epsilon n. This is for any such j. This is what we mean by in the bulk for epsilon fixed. It's for given j, it's not the vector in j balance. Uh, it's for, 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 for any such j, which is just one j, this is a random variable depending on j, and n goes to infinity, and no matter which deterministic j you have chosen in this range, this, you have this convergence. Okay, uh, so this is for the bulk and for the edge. This your uh, lambda j, your lambda n minus 2, and to the two thirds converges to this Tw, um, which some people were worried about before. That's Tw beta, Tracy Widom with general parameter beta. And I will not describe it, just one distribution. Okay. Um, So that's one thing, and um, this is about the, the spectrum, and uh, the, the goal of these lectures will be to prove that for general random matrices, the same types of distribution with beta equal 1 and 2 occur. Um, and I will also talk a little bit about eigenvectors in the next lecture. And for eigenvectors, things look much simpler in some sense, because, um, you know, what is universality? You know, this is a very high dimensional system, n goes to infinity, it's so n by n matrix. So you need to identify universal laws by restricting to very small dimension things. This is a small dimension one, for example. And um, for eigenvectors, this is still a high dimensional object. If you want to talk about university, you can, for example, look at the projection or the coordinates of an eigenvector. And uh, for GOE, this is particularly simple because this is how measure. 
So any eigenvector is uniformly distributed on the sphere, and you know this result, um, which uh, can be attributed to Borel or Levy, that when you project on any deterministic direction um, uniform point on the sphere, up to a scaling, it becomes a Gaussian. So um, for eigenvectors, um, university statements are much more simple, and uh, you can just derive them. Okay, uh, but we will also prove them by the end of the of the lectures. Now, um, once I have stated what what these distributions, um, how these distributions occur, I can give a bit more of motivation about um, fields which are completely unrelated to random matrix theory and where they are found as well. Um, and this is really just a a side um, part of my talk, and it will be just 15 minutes or something. Oops. So historically, one of the main examples is um, that the Godin distribution with parameter 2 uh, appears in um, analytic number theory. So let's call this Montgomery. So it's actually very easy to state what Montgomery's conjecture is. You know the Riemann zeta function, which can be defined in two manners. This is a function of importance for describing primes, um, the set of primes here, and there's a sum for n greater or equal to 1. This definition makes sense for any real part of s greater than 1, but there is an analytic extension um, everywhere to the complex plane except one pole at 1. Okay? And um, of fundamental importance is the study of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, and I assume the Riemann hypothesis here in my statement of Montgomery's conjecture. So let's assume the Riemann hypothesis. So we are here. Here is my critical axis. And we assume that the non trivial zeros of zeta are aligned on this dotted line here. So here they are. They, are, they, they come in pairs by an obvious symmetry with respect to the real axis. And let me call them as a consequence um, one half plus or minus i rho n for ordered rho one, uh, which are uh, positive. Okay. So this is assuming error. So we, there are things we know very well, in particular, how many of them are there up to some level. So the number of um, i, so the rho i is between 0 and some level uh, t. Grows like uh, T log T. With just a normalization 1 over 2 pi here. This is something that you can see in any good book about the Riemann zeta function. Okay. Um, now, what this tells you in particular is that they get more and more packed. So if I want to have a statement relating to random matrix theory, I want to rescale them to have an average spacing 1. And I rescale them in the following way, as a consequence. Define omega n to be um, rho n, so 1 over 2 pi, rho n log rho n. <coughs> so now the average spacing between these guys becomes 1. And it happens that uh, in the large n limit, when you do the histogram, it coincides with this random matrix thing. But that's a conjecture. Yeah. Yes. 
What is this for? So the conjecture is, as n goes to infinity, if you take the average of um, omega i plus 1 minus omega i, so this is uh, a distribution. And this converges weakly to uh, your go down with parameter 2. <coughs> and of course, this is related to this uh, Hilbert Polya ID that there are maybe some spectral interpretation of the zeros of zeta, but this is very speculative. Okay. But the numerics are extremely convincing. This is actually the, one of the most remarkable parts here. Okay, so, but this may be seen a bit uh, as a non-universal thing, but it's supposed to hold to a very, very much wider class of L functions. And uh, also, um, it happens that uh, these types of discrete analogs, discrete sums converging to Godin occurs in much more universal context. For example, if you look at the Laplacian of a, uh, on a compact manifold. So this is the so-called Boigas Janoni Schmidt. So here I'm, I'm really trying to exhibit deterministic settings for which these uh, distributions are supposed to occur. Um, so imagine you have a you have a manifold, a compact. Let's, let's take dimension 2 to simplify in my notations. That's m. Um, it, uh, I endo it with some Riemannian metric. And uh, let's call mu the measure associated to my Riemannian metric. And um, I consider delta, which is uh, the Laplace Beltrami. for the Riemannian metric. And you can look at the um, at the Helmholtz equation. So you you look at you look for diagonalizing um, the Laplace Beltrami. And I order my lambda i's again. Uh, maybe, uh, sorry, I should choose another notation instead of lambda i here. Let, let's call these guys uh, uh, mu k. Yeah. So you mean closed manifold without boundary? Uh, I, I take it without boundary. Actually, there are analogs with boundaries. Um, Boyga Janoni Schmidt conjecture was originally for BRT um, with the Richley boundary condition, but I just want to simplify things here. Okay. Uh, psi k is it a coordinate function or a just? Psi k are just my eigenstates. Okay. Okay. Uh, so um, now you, how many mu k's do you have up to some level? So these mu k's are ordered. And uh, the Weil law tells you that Um, the number of mu k up to some level L is equivalent as L goes to plus infinity to some constant depending on the manifold times L. It just grows linearly. The mu one is non-zero, the first one, the first eigenvalue. I mean, I, I just... Uh, the, 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 the first eigenvalue is non-zero. Okay, 
So both, both of them are correct. Um, so we um, we now rescale to have an average gap equal to one. And what happens is um, now if I look at one over, um, let's say, so I, I look uh, up to some level L. So, and I look at my gaps between mu k plus one minus mu k. I rescale by cm to add an average gap equal to one. And this is for all the, for the sum over all mu k smaller than L. This converges as L goes to plus infinity to now the Godin distribution, but with parameter one. And uh, I must say that this, this is not a clean cut conjecture because it depends on the manifold. But it's true for typical manifolds. Let's say for most manifolds, even though it doesn't mean much. Okay. Okay. Um, so in other words, uh, wh what I mean by most manifolds is that the, the classical dynamics, just uh, the, the geodesic type of dynamics, are uh, mixing enough. In particular, if, if uh, the classical dynamics and the manifold are not integrable, you cannot predict where the trajectory is going to be in the long term, uh, then this is supposed to be true. What it means is that any time you have a lot of mixing, underlying randomness, and so on, you supposedly observe the random matrix statistics. Okay, so just, this is completely out of reach, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, uh, numerics are very convincing. So uh, I saw many numerics for, um, for example, in the Biard context, in the context, if you take a cardioid, mm -hmm. it really fits well. If you take, uh, uh, I saw dozens of them, um, but whether I can tell you it is true, no. <laughs> stadiums? Uh, if, uh, yeah, for stadiums, yes. Uh, the numerics work. Um, okay. All right. Are there, are there any questions about this this introduction? No. Yeah. If beta is not equal to one or two, do we have uh, the matrix uh, is uh, a representation of uh, normal variables on the coefficients? So uh, matrix representations of this uh, beta ensemble type of measure is going to be, uh, I'm sure, uh, mentioned by Balint in, uh, this week. So um, the answer is yes. Um, now, um, what else do we want to do here? Um, OK, so let me state the results of universality. So. Um, what I will prove this week is the following fact. I change my matrix. I still keep independent entries, uh, but I um, consider uh, um, the variance that may change and the fact that they are not Gaussian. So this is a so-called generalized Wigner matrix. So I'm still going to denote them H. Um, so let's assume that they are centered. Um, I'm going to denote the variance of uh, Hij, Sij. And I will always assume that it's of order 1 over n, between a small and a large constant over n. Um, the reason is uh, that I, I, we only can deal for, for these results for, um, in uh, mean field models. 
Okay, I, I wish I could impose some geometry here on the randomness, but uh, this is not the topic uh, in the next two days. Okay. Um, and I, uh, to have the sim limiting semicircle distribution, I will also assume that uh, for any i, the sum of Sij is 1. We will see that um, under these assumptions, you always end up with a semicircle distribution. That's my variance. It's defined just a line above. Okay. So um, now uh, the theorem is here. And uh, this is a theorem um, for which uh, ideas I like a lot are due to Erdoslein and Yao. And, uh, but many people participated and it would be hard to mention all of them. But I will try in, during the proof to, to, to mention some, some key ideas. Yes? You assume that the, the H, I, J are independent? Yes, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm coming to that. So under the assumption of moments, that for um, that the supremum over I A J of um, that for any P, if I take my root n h i j and I assume that it has a finite piece mo moment under this assumption uh, then you have universality so this is easily said in the following manner um, oh I erased it so um, So if you take n times the semicircle distribution at lambda j times lambda j minus lambda j, this one converges to um, my go down with parameter 1 because I'm looking at symmetric random matrices here, but the same thing holds for Hermitian ones. So that's the first point. And the second point is uh, whatever you remember about Tracy Widom is true. So that means that your n to the two third times lambda, the greatest eigenvalue lambda n converges, in fact, in distribution to this Tracy Widom with parameter with parameter one. Okay. So this is the main goal here. And. Um, If you want to start uh, proving such thing, it's really not clear what's the first step, right? Um, there is no formula you can start with. Um, but maybe, uh, for example, for the last line here, uh, when, when you want to prove convergence in distribution, the first step is to prove its right scale. Okay, so, so let, let's talk about scales and let's try to, to prove that these things are on the good scale. So to talk about the skills, I need to uh, mention the local laws. And um, to talk about the local laws, le let, me talk, let me tell a little bit about the green function.
So, um, probably Simone last week told a lot about green functions. Well, maybe I'm completely wrong, but I th think she did. Um, so, um, let's introduce this, uh, well, let me redefine this h of z, g of z is 1 over h minus z. Um, now my h is not a GOE anymore, it's, uh, for example, your favorite generalized Wigner matrix. You can think about plus or minus one entries, for example. Okay? Sorry. Uh, the absolute value is uh, a norm? Or it's a value? The expectation is missing, that's true. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so let's try, thanks to this object, to understand the semicircle distribution. And let's see why, by pushing the methods, you can understand um, that you have the good skills. Okay. Um, so imagine you want to prove the semicircle distribution. Um, an idea that goes back to Pasteur, I think, uh, is the following one. I have my big matrix. If I remove one line and one column, what remains is basically the same uh, in the large dimension limit. So it look, just should look the same. But I know that I have a coherence relation by the short complement formula between both objects. So um, in such cases, either the formula tells you something non-trivial or it will be completely useless. Um, so, but it happens that it gives something highly non-trivial, okay? Um, so, uh, actually, let, let's just... Uh, let's just do it, okay? So I have my H11 entry here, H1, H1 star. And uh, let's call the remaining, the remainder h1. Okay, and this is just a one size one and n minus one. Now, what the short complement tells you. is um, that your, if I define g tilde uh, g1 of z to be 1 over h1 minus z, uh, the entry 1, 1 of g of z can also be written in the following form. So um, go back to your um, undergrad classes, short complement, linear algebra, and this is just true, okay? Um, now, um, there are obviously many ways to, to prove it. So let's talk about the size of these objects here. I, I have my, my semicircle distribution. this, and I, I see it also as a domain of the complex plane, and I, I have my z in the complex plane, okay? So um, my circle is not in the complex plane, but anyways. Um, so h11, remember, is this is a random variable divided by square root n. So compared to this, basically nothing. Um, my h1 star g1 h1, this is a quadratic form uh, with my um, entries independent here, if you take the expectation, for example, you will see that the, diag the diagonal terms in the quadratic form should be prominent. 
Okay. So, but if the diagonal terms are prominent, then this is something like 1 over n times, times the trace of g1. So you, you, you may think it's, it's, it should be close to 1 over n times the trace of g1. Okay. This we don't care. And this was proved for G11, but of course the same should hold for any distinguished entry I chose first. So if I take the average over all of these entries one that I choose first, I get something, some coherence relation for the trace. Okay. Which is non-trivial. So hence we expect the following fact that 1 over n the sum of g i i and 1 and n is not too far from 1 over minus z minus the trace of uh, g1. Now, one problem is, here I have the trace of G1, but here this is the trace of G. So, if you believe in this Pasteur self-similarity ID, both of them should be the same in the large n limit. If you want to argue about it, uh, you can, for example, use interlacing of the eigenvalues. Okay? By interlacing, you have some constraints and you're good. So, we assume it's correct. We assume that this is actually not too far by interlacing. Of uh, not too far from one over n trace of g one. Um, so now the quadratic equation you obtain is exactly the same as the one that was characterizing the Stilgers transform of the GOE or GUE that I mentioned before, right? So, um, and so we have the following fact, which is, this, uh, which is that this S of Z 1 over n trace of uh, g of z, g1 or g, doesn't matter, um, so you can rewrite your equation as s of z plus 1 over s of z plus z not too far from 0. It happens that you have some stability estimates for, the, for this quadratic equation. First, uh, of course, there are two solutions. How do you choose? Uh, you have some constraints that the imaginary part of S of Z needs to be positive, for example, with my choice of, of definition. So this uh, gives only one possible definition. And once you are dealing with this uh, solution, having a good estimate for the error of this term implies a good estimate on S of Z. Um, so, as a consequence, what by stability, S of Z is not too far from uh, what I was calling M of Z, the still just transform of the semicircle. Now, many things are unclear from a mathematical rigor point of view. Um, in particular, this is not too hard to be made rigorous when z has a fixed imaginary part, but if the imaginary part of z decreases with n, um, the types of estimates for this, is keeping only the trace, they deteriorate a lot. So it's not clear you can make this work. Um, so it's a theorem by Erdos, uh, Yao, and Yin, 
that you can, you can get optimal error estimates on any mesoscopic scale. And uh, by mm, running all of this, you get the following local laws that I'm going to write now. So, um, how far can you get? Yes, please go ahead. What's the evidence? Uh, I think I introduced it as being the Stilges transform of uh, the semicircle distribution. So that's my, uh, or maybe I forgot, and my apologies if I did. Um, that's my definition. Okay. So my question is, how far can you get with, with just you know, with some very difficult tricks using this stability? How far can you get using difficult tricks, no, you say? Not, not, not difficult, difficult. okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's difficult for me to judge about the difficulty of what others did. So that's the first thing. But, um, but uh, the second thing is um, that there is one very important trick that was used for getting to uh, the optimal rigidity estimate. So actually, I will comment on, on this just in a minute after stating the result. So here is a, the optimal local law. So um, here is a definition. If I have a sequence of two random variables, xn and yn, I'm going to write xn dominated in this way by yn um, when the following holds. For any small epsilon, and big uh, D, the probability that xn is greater than n to the epsilon yn, that's smaller than n to the minus D for large enough n. So, so in particular, yn is really dominated by, uh, xn is really dominated by yn up to some n to the epsilon factor. Um, as n goes to infinity. Oops. Um, so uh, after this very short notation, here is a, the, the optimal um, local law. So it's, um, it's basically two statements. Um, the first one is, here I told you about the trace, but we will also be interested in the individual entries. And what you have is a GII, but not only GII, also GJJ, minus um, this is at point Z. This is bounded by something, but this something needs to depend on Z, because my estimates need to deteriorate when I get to the microscopic scale. Okay, so I need to define the domain for Z first. So I defined D to be um, the set of Z, which will always be denoted E plus Ieta, such that, um, let's say E is more than 10, and uh, eta is between 1 and n to the minus 1 plus some small epsilon. Okay, so I choose a very small epsilon, I define this d, and for any z in d, this is um, of order at most 1 over n eta, plus something which deteriorates at the edge, and is a, actually a 1 over square root of n eta and the imaginary part of m of z. Okay, so, so let's 
let's just um, identify whether this really defines the leading order. Uh, M of Z, uh, imagine you are in the bulk. M of Z is the imaginary part of your stages transform at 1 over n times the sum. Um, that, that's your limiting stages transform. It's of order 1. M of Z, when you get to the, to the axis, actually converges to the density. So this is order 1. And what this tells you is that this is on the diagonal of this object of order 1, and off diagonal, something which is close to 0. And indeed, for eta greater than n to the minus 1 plus epsilon, this, these errors are much smaller than order 1. This you can check. So this tells you that the, as a matrix, G, the resolvent, converges to the diagonal matrix with M on the diagonal. But something more happens when you look at the trace. You get a, be, um, you get a better error estimate. Because here you see, um, actually, if you're in the bulk, the main term is this one, because you have a 1 over square root of an eta, which is worse than 1 over an eta. And, um, but if you use this, it will not be sufficient for uh, our um, estimates uh, later on. This is for individual entries, but when you make an average, you gain something. So in particular, uh, S of Z minus M of Z is always bounded by 1 over n. So the average works better, as expected. Um, now, to answer your question, if you push the method um, à la Pasteur, trying to go to small scales and so on, um, getting these estimates for GII is something very much non-trivial. You need to do a multiscale analysis, but does not require uh, additional incredible uh, tricks. Say. To quantify the fact that the average you have an extra cancellation is actually very hard. And uh, for this you don't need to do just one short complement. You need to uh, look at large moments of this quantity and do uh, quite a few short complements together. But uh, this is way too technical for what I want to say here. Okay. So this is um, a result uh, that implies the rigidity of the eigenvalues and the fact that they are on the good scale. This gives the rigidity, this would not. Okay, so we, we just have a flavor about how to prove these things, and I assume this holds. I just want to derive one simple consequence, two, a couple simple consequences before the end here. So here's a corollary one. So this result I probably mentioned, but I'm not sure. In the optimal form here, was derived by Erdos, uh, Yao, and Yin. Um, the first corollary is eigenvector delocalization. Um, so there is this meta conjecture that when you have random matrix statistics for the spectrum, it means that the eigenstates are delocalized. Namely, if you look at them as a, as a measure by the L2 norm, um, the, this measure gives mass a bit everywhere. Um, and uh, the counterpart of this meta conjecture is that when you have a Poisson type of statistics for the eigenvalues, uh, you should have localization of the eigenvector. And uh, here, what we just confirm is that uh, indeed we, we have eigenvector delocalization for these de generalized Wigner matrices in the following sense. Um, so, if I name, so remember that my spectrum is lambda 1 up to lambda n, and let's call uh, u1 un the associated eigenvectors. and uh, they are normalized in L2. Um, so then what you have is that uh, the supnorm of any of this UK, no matter which one, is of order at most 1 over square root n. So 
So um, this is obviously the best you can hope for in terms of polynomial scales, right? Because uh, the sum of the squares sums to one. Okay, so each entry is, a, is at most one over square root n is the best you can hope for. The, 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 the true conjecture about what the maximum should be involves some logarithmic factors. But in terms of, of um, polynomial scales, that's, that's what it is. Um, and uh, how do you derive this, this estimate from the local law? It's very easy. You just look at one entry of the resolvent and it tells you something about the eigenvector. So is everything clear here about my notations and so on? Uniformly for all k, or if this k, this is true. Uh, so um, you um, you can take the sup over k. That's that's also correct. The reason it's correct is, you know, in my definition of uh, domination here, my error is so small, and this n to the minus d, any union bounds will make, will do the job. Okay. So, um, so imagine you're interested in lambda k, or in uk. You want to prove that the supernorm of uk is not too big. So you know that your lambda k is somewhere. And uh, you're going to choose one point just above the lambda k. Okay, um, at distance n to the minus 1 plus epsilon, I assume that my lambda k is in the bulk of the spectrum. The proof at the edge is basically the same, just adapting the scales. Um, and let's look at the resolvent. But I want to bound, for example, the entry number i of uk. So I will look at the resolvent, the coordinate i, i. So of course, for the resolvent, you have this, this formula. When you diagonalize your h, um, which is clear. So if you have some bound on g, it can tell you something about the eigenvectors. But for this, you need to choose your z in an appropriate way. Oops. So let me repeat that I'm choosing my z to be exactly this point. Okay. So you may say, how can you apply the local law with the z, which is random because it depends on lambda k? Okay. Because I, I want to say that my g of z, the coordinate i i is of order at most 1. Um, so strictly speaking, my, my, I stated the local law for fixed z's. But again, because the, the error estimates are so strong, you can prove it simultaneously for a grid which is extremely dense. And then use, it, uh, use a standard Lipschitz argument for g to prove that it's true uniformly for z in the domain. Mm -hmm. In other words, I can, yes, but what I mean is I, I, could, I could write the sup over z here uh, and have uh, bound by 1. Okay. That's, that's an easy thing to do. Okay. Um, so in particular, I am allowed to take this z. Um, so g of z 1 1 is of order at most 1. Okay. So in particular, the imaginary part um, of the ii entry is of order at most 1. But what is the imaginary part? So that's my sum 1 over n. 
them. Um, so I have my, um, uh, so it's um, E minus lambda J square plus eta square eta. And here I have U um, K of I square. And that's not a K, that's a J. Okay, just write what it is, if that's what you get. Um, so we know that this is of order at most one. Okay. So in particular, which eigenvalue am I interested in? I'm, I'm interested in uh, the case one. So I take j equal lambda k. This is the sum of positive numbers. So the j equal k um, factor is also dominated by this. So you just take j equal k. For j equal k, uh, my, um, my e minus lambda k is at 0. I choose my e accordingly. And my uh, eta over eta squared, but that's a 1 over eta. So I have 1 over n eta. Uh, so this is bounded by my uh, n eta. So, um, so I forget my 1 over n. And I get u um, k of i square, which is bounded by n eta. And by my choice of eta, this is an n to the epsilon. Okay. So, um, so this is true for any epsilon, and you're done. So you understand uh, the localization properties from the resolvent. That's basically the only message here. Okay. So the second application I want to mention is this uh, rigidity of eigenvalues. And it will be um, quite useful um, in the following for us. Let's corollary too. Um, okay, so what this says is uh, if you define, let's say, k hat to be the minimum between k and n plus 1 minus k. So this k hat is, in terms of indices, the distance to the edge. Okay. Um, then your lambda k is going to be a distance from from gamma k, so you remember gamma k is the quantile, that's, that's where you expect it after, after ordering. So that's going to be of order n to the minus 2 third k hat to the minus 1 third. So this is uh, something quantifying exactly uh, in, term, is optim in an optimal way in terms of polynomial scales where you expect these eigenvalues. Um, so let's let's check um, the, the at least the bulk and the edge scaling limits. So if k is in the bulk, this is of order n, and I have an n to the minus one oscillation, meaning that my lambda k is going to be very rigid around this typical location. It's basically only allowed to go visit its first neighbors. Okay. And at the edge, you really get n to the minus two. Sorry. Right. So. How do you prove some such things from, from the Stilgest transform? You know, it's, it's a well-known fact that the Stilgest transform convergence implies convergence of the measure. Uh, but here we want to quantify. So we need to just, you know, do the job. Um, so one way to do that as follows. So I have five minutes for the proof, so fine. You um, 
you want to have, you want to count your eigenvalues. How many do, I, do you have uh, up to some level and have optimal fluctuations and so on? So you will find a function which approximates a step function for counting. And you would like this step function or approximate step function to be re possibly uh, represented thanks to the suggestion form by some Cauchy integral formula. Um, so you cannot do it exactly, of course, if it's a step function, but if you choose this function here, um, let's take um, let's take your f of uh, so um, this is a function um, that looks like this. Okay, and uh, then you can rescale it. Here you are between minus two and two you are now considering an energy level E and you want to count how many eigenvalues do I have up to E. And if fluctuations are small, this implies this guy. Um, so G of Z. So you introduce this function, okay, for, for your rescaling. So this is a function which will be here and oscillating on a scale n to the minus one plus epsilon. And it's basically constant except in this window. So window size n to the minus one plus epsilon. And my E is supposed here to be in the bulk. Let me just prove it in the bulk. Uh, the edge is about adapting the scales. Sorry? Um, so I want to prove this for fixed k, that's right. And here I have a fixed e. So now my lambda k is not related to e at all anymore. Uh, I just choose a fixed e. If for any fixed e you have a good estimate about how many before and how many after with small fluctuations, this implies this guy. Um, so um, so now I need to be careful with my, with my scales. So what you can write is uh, that your average of, so you want to count how many eigenvalues. So the sum of G of lambda i. And what you hope um, is that this is going to be very close to n times the integral of G with respect to semicircle. Okay. But now the Cauchy formula tells you, because this is analytic, there are some poles, but we will talk about them after. Um, so uh, I'm going to write it this way, on some contour of your um, G of Z times you are still just transform minus m of z. Okay, not too hard to find this. Just take, uh, it's, it's, it's of course true without the sum. This can be understood as a sum. And, uh, and then it's true. Just, okay. um, but for s of z minus m of z, that's exactly the object we have a good bound on. And Okay, so you say your g of lambda. So it's just about one over, uh, so my notation for z is, that's what I do. And you sum it and you're done. And, um, now, this is not true for any control because there are some poles, okay? But this is true if I choose my control properly. And this tells you why you needed the scales. Because the poles, where are they? So remember, you have this, your semicircle between minus two and two. And uh, your poles are exactly here. At these points, which are of the following type, E plus or minus, and to the epsilon over n, and i to k plus one, to j plus one. 
if you have a point of this type, then it's a pole. So your contour needs to go below that point. Okay. So you are choosing a contour which will be this way. I take 45 degrees here for the slope. And I go far. And, um, and remember that uh, this s of z minus m of z is 1 over n eta. I multiply by n, it's 1 over eta. But I have no n dependence anymore. It's just the integral of 1 over eta along this contour. 1 over the distance over this contour. But 1 over the distance, you just get a log factor when you get close. So that's fine. You just lose the log factor, you don't care. Um, if you had the local law, so coming back to your question, if you had the local law only with the 1 over square root of n eta instead of 1 over n eta, you would just lose too much by this process. Well, 1 over n eta is really necessary. Okay? If you have the local law with 1 over square root n eta, that corresponds to the same accuracy as a Poisson point process, basically. The 1 over n eta makes a difference. Okay. Uh, so I will stop here. You can, you can finish this proof easily by just checking the whole thing. And uh, tomorrow we, we completely forget about this first and we do the dynamics of dyson brown motion. So what does it mean? It means, um, I mean, are you, are you wondering about the, why, why is this wording or why? Why is called deep localization? I mean, uh, when I say this drug, I can't pronounce it Why do you mean that deep localization? Okay, so you know that uh, if you look at UK of I the squares, it defines a measure, yes. okay? So the sum of these guys is one. It could be that you have uh, just a spike and uh, with the whole mass there. But what this tells you is that it cannot be true. It needs to be that all of the entries have a, have a size order 1 over square root n. So there is mass everywhere. That's why we call it delocalization. Just nothing complicated. Okay. Size order.